Hello again. Welcome to the third installment in this series. Today we're going to discuss the Chinese room argument formulated by philosopher John Searle. The problem being posed in this thought experiment is the problem of computational intelligence. Take a look. The Chinese room. Can a machine ever be truly called intelligent? American philosopher and Rhodes scholar John Searle certainly can. In 1980, he proposed the Chinese Room Thought Experiment in order to challenge the concept of strong artificial intelligence, and not because of some 80s design fad. He imagines himself in a room with boxes of Chinese characters he can't understand, and a book of instructions which he can. If a Chinese speaker outside the room passes him messages under the door, Searle can follow instructions from the book to select an appropriate response. The person on the other side would think they're chatting with a Chinese speaker, just one who doesn't get out much. But really, it's a confused philosopher. Now, according to Alan Turing, the father of computer science, if a computer program can convince a human they're communicating with another human, then it could be said to think. The Chinese room suggests that, however well you program a computer, it doesn't understand Chinese, it only simulates that knowledge, which isn't really intelligent. But then sometimes humans aren't that intelligent either. In the third part of my series on materialism, I addressed this argument, and the link to the timestamp is in the description box. However, I want to delve a little bit more into what I meant. I know in the last video, I was, cut, I was quite long, and a little too belaboring of the point so i'm going to split it up and this video is going to be shorter i've just been very busy with work but i hope to get around to splitting this video up the last video that is what is necessary for a computer to understand chinese in fact what does it mean to understand anything well now it's time for our good friend wilfred sellers Sellers' idea in regards to intentionality and meaning was in terms of picturing. There must exist a psycholinguistic connection between the word and the object. So the question is how to establish connection with phenomena in our environment. It comes from our various categorizations of environmental stimuli. Here's a sample of the lecture given by Sellers on this topic. Which uh, corresponds to something satisfies codex as a lion, and quote, or X is a quote, X is a lion, close quote, is true of something. So the, the concept of some and the notion of something is indispensable, but it, as I said, it's, the challenge is to explain its connection with extra-linguistic reality. Now, some philosophers have tended to overlook this problem because in dealing with formalized languages, the resources of which are recursively specified by an effective procedure, they use a concept of reference which is not that of a connection between expressions and items in the world, though it is, in an interesting sense, parasitical upon it. They use a concept which is defined in purely logical terms. Thus, X refers to Y, all hyphenated, in a certain language, equals by definition. X equals, quote, New York in L, and y equals New York, or x equals, quote, Chicago in L, and y equals Chicago, or x equals, quote, Nixon in L, and y equals Nixon, or, 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 or. Such a defined notion, as I pointed out in my paper for the Carnap volume some 20 years ago, is useful in constructing a recursive account of the semantical properties of the expressions of a formalized language. Notice that it won't do to grant the general point that the word triangularity has a psycholinguistic connection with something, but argue that it is with triangular things. For triangularity is neither constituted by nor identical with any collection of triangular things and could be uh, referred to as readily if there were no triangular things. The classical Platonist was perfectly content to speak of real relations between forms and persons. He was willing to use the language of vision and of intercourse. He was, uh, Plato's forms made themselves known to us by acting on our minds. And if the concept of a cause which does not change in the course of causing is a puzzling one, at least uh, it was a serious, it represents a serious attempt to deal with a serious problem. In Neoplatonism, this causation became the agency of God. But the concept of the illumination of the mind was essentially the, essentially the same. 
Platonists believed themselves aware of experiencing the forms, but they also thought that their influence, whether we were aware of it or not, was necessary to explain how we could think of the world as we do and how we could know mathematical, ethical, and metaphysical truths. Many philosophers who have an ontology which includes irreducible abstract objects have felt uncomfortable about the idea of a causal relation between these objects and persons. They have contented themselves with the term awareness. We are aware of universals. We are aware of classes. We are aware of classes of classes of attributes and the rest. Uh, whether awareness is considered as an act, as a relation, or a tie, it is a connection in the spirit of our challenge. The extreme demand for a simple prohibition of abstract entities under all circumstances perhaps arises from a desire to maintain the connection between theory and observation. But the preference of, say, seeing over understanding as a method of observation seems to me capricious. For just as an opaque a body may be seen, so a concept may be understood or grasped. And the parallel between the two cases in, is indeed rather close. In both cases, the observation is not direct, but through intermediaries. Light, lenses of eye, or optical instruments in the one case, in the retina, and linguistic expressions in the case of the concept. Now there, Alonzo Church recognizes that if one is seriously going to put on abstract entities in one's ontology, one does need to have something like a psycholinguistic connection between language and these objects. So as you can see, the formulation of abstract singular terms is kind of a tricky one. This is especially true if we're going to gauge how fine-grained a machine's sense of distinction between various stimuli can be. This elucidates a problem with the notion of immediate givenness, even for machines. I have some friends who are in computer science, and they are taking machine learning classes and artificial intelligence classes. They have to train their algorithms with data in order to better um, the computer's ability to categorize and improve accuracy. So as you see, it's not a black and white issue, both perceptually and computationally. An issue brought up by the idealist pseudo-philosopher Johannin Rotz is the issue of qualia. In my last video, I dealt with qualia by referring to givenness, inversion, intellection, and psycholinguistic factors. In this part, I'm going to bury it alive because the problem arises, what is qualia? A further problem with qualia derived from a bigger pr um, problem of determinant reference that Sellers mentioned. This is especially problematic when dealing with entities that are logically private. Giving names to them doesn't help because you could all be talking about different things. But in the following clip concerning synesthesia, it is shown that the concept of qualia may not be applicable given the various modalities of experience that people can have of various stimuli. Note that these people have very bizarre experiences and can only articulate them through reference of previous phenomena acquired through linguistic intellection and learning. Let's take a look. When someone talks to James, he doesn't just hear the words, he also tastes them. I have a problem with the name Derek, for instance, which it's, you know, it's horrible. It's um, earwax. John sees colours when he hears numbers. They're just like flashing colours. For example, one will be a, a whitish colour and two will be an orangey colour. And Heather is able to make quick calculations because she literally sees her numbers around her. I've got naught in front of me here, and I have naught to ten, and then ten to twenty in an L shape. Then 20 to 30, and that's all on a plane. They all have a bizarre condition called synesthesia, in which their senses are joined up. For a long time, no one took people like them seriously. But now it turns out, they're not so different from the rest of us. And their condition may even help explain how we made that great evolutionary leap to develop language. Now, if you noticed, all of these synesthetes have developed their own conceptual framework by which they make sense of the relatively alien phenomena that they experience. 
Now think about this for a second. These synesthetes, in a sense, have a second phenomenology. This is due to the fact that they have multiple modalities of the same perception. Now imagine if this alternative phenomenology was normalized to the human population. That is, everyone was a synesthete. What then? We would, in the same way as now, come up with a conceptual structure by which we make sense of our phenomena. But the objectively existing environmental stimuli would still be there. Now further imagine if we were synesthetes who had an inversion in that qualia, and it changed our memory of past qualia, and this happened every night before we went to bed. There wouldn't be any functional difference. The point that I'm trying to show is that qualia are subjective in every sense. They are ontologically subjective because they aren't physical and they can be experienced differently by different minds. But they are also epistemically subjective because different conceptual structures will have different qualia, as with the example, of course, with the himba that I keep using, and with this other example. Years ago, everything that I am, my anxieties speaking to all you people, and my thoughts and my memories, somehow are encoded and stored in this three pound lump of tissue. But of course, um, I didn't pop out of my mother's womb as Bruce. Uh, that would have been a bit strange. I had to become. I had to develop into Bruce. And so there's a developmental process. How does that happen? Well, um, you're all familiar now. The brain is made up of vast networks of billions of neurons, and they all communicate with each other through these electrical impulses. And that information is <coughs> interpreted, coded into these synchronized patterns that we are basically representations of the external world, or representations. Representations are, are the language of, of, of the brain. And even thoughts and memories that you dwell upon or bring to consciousness are representation systems. So how do those representations get there? Well, I think some are built in, but a lot of them are acquired through experience. So this is my interest, by the way. I'm a developmental neuroscientist. Uh, the baby brain is a lot smaller, but what you may not appreciate, it actually has more or less the full complement of neurons as an adult, around about 86 billion. But what is changing, of course, is the connectivity between those neurons. Um, Basically, there are two processes. There's a very rapid explosion of connectivity, uh, this sort of progressive uh, wiring up, generation of synapses. But uh, there's equally a degeneration or pruning back of experience. And the reason this happens, it's a way that the environment can literally shape the brain. Because you don't want to keep connections which are never going to be lost, uh, never going to be used. And in this way, you know, the brain is literally being shaped. And this has some interesting consequences. For example, you know that every child has the capability to learn language. If they're born of Japanese parents and raised in the US, they will easily, effortlessly acquire, acquire English. But in, inquiring, uh, in, a, in developing expertise, you become tuned in to your particular environment and lose the capability and flexibility of hearing and perceiving other aspects. So this explains, for example, why it's often difficult to hear the differences in other languages. Um, we can test this out. Uh, let's have a go. Let's see how good you are with Hindi. So I want you to listen very carefully, and uh, you'll hear two segments of Hindi. You know, this is audience participation, by the way, uh, time. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if you think they're the same or different. I'll prompt you, by the way. So pay, pay attention. Let's get the sound up on this. You ready? Tuck. Tuck. Hands up if you think they're different. Hands up if you think they're the same. Yep, they're, they're different. One's a word, and one's a complete non-word, apparently. Here's another example. Dull, dull. Different? You got it? Ah, oh, you get it. You learn handy fast. Um, yeah, they actually are different. In general, though, it's very, very hard to tell these sorts of things. It's not just sounds and voices, it's also faces. We are wiring in and tuning into the environment. The next one's a really good example. I used this last time I talked, but it's such a, it, it makes a couple of really interesting points. So um, this is the McGurk effect. So watch carefully and see, uh, tell me what you think he's saying. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, ba. Hands up if you heard da, 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 da. Pretty reliable. You probably put money on it. Okay. This time, close your eyes and listen carefully. You ready? Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, he's saying ba, ba. He's not saying da, da at all. Um, why do you hear that? Well, it's because, actually, what we've done is we've cheated a little bit. We're using, he's mouthing. Gaga, okay? So that shape of that visual information, you don't have any representation in your brain for that shape of mouth and that sound. So your brain basically 
comes up with a solution to make sense of this incompatible information. So you don't have any direct contact with reality. Your brain is giving that to you all the time, trying to make sense of the world of ambiguity and missing information. Here. The same is true computationally. Rats and others would argue that the robot or machine must experience quality. Why? I mean, even if it did experience qualia, it wouldn't be like anything else humans have experienced. Think about it. Would a computer see color? Why would that necessarily be the only way to interpret the electromagnetic spectrum? My view is that the representation is irrelevant when it comes to computers being conscious, and that the subject of artificial intelligence need only be able to form categorization and build on previously interpreted phenomena. The ability to discriminate between various phenomena along with heightened vividness and givenness acquired through the continuous restructuring of processing algorithms and computational architecture would be good enough for me. As in the first part of this series, I made the point that consciousness is effectively a symphony orchestra with many parts to it. However, if you hear a symphony, you'll essentially hear it as a huge big pileup of sound in which no one's willing to stop or give in to anyone else. In the first video, I included a clip of AI researcher and professor Marvin Minsky breaking down the concept of consciousness. Here in this clip, he's breaking down the concept of understanding language. But computer people do not concede so easily. Marvin Minsky tries to refute Searle's argument with an analogy. For example, suppose you'd never seen a car before, and here comes a car and it drives along, and someone tells you it's a car. Well, you learn that. That's, that's a car. You can recognize one by its sight and its sound and so forth. And some philosopher might ask, what is the essence of that idea of car? And so, let's bring a car and take it apart. And here's a wheel. Is that a car? No, it's part of a car. Is there any carness in it? Who knows? Uh, and we take it all apart and we get little pistons and cylinders and wires and gears. And there's no car there. It's just a bunch of parts. The point is that the idea of a car is on a higher level. It's not very interesting level, but it's, it's that a car is the relation of wheels and an engine and so forth. And you can't reduce it to the other little parts, but that doesn't mean that it's very mysterious. But I think that's the answer to the Chinese room puzzle. Uh, of course, there's no understanding in the Chinese room of Chinese, nor is there anything like understanding in your head. That's a social word used for fooling people into not asking questions about how things really work. And most of our words are for that purpose. What the machine would need is the ability to picture certain environmental stimuli through memory. What I mean is that there needs to be an object concept that is instantiated into the memory database of the machine. Over time, the machine will refine itself after literally thousands of trials. Associations will be the substrate of the conceptual framework by which environmental stimuli are computationally perceived. Consciousness is what I would expect from a hierarchically and multiply organized central processing unit which executes, in parallel with other jobs, the function of stochastically processing and learning environmental signals by Bayesian inference, a function which itself is effectively and efficiently mediated by both the plasticity of the continuously developing processing architecture to its environment and the rapid improvement in predictive modeling as information is analogically processed and interpreted. Thanks for watching. In the next video, I'll be discussing the development of the given. Thank you.